The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 752 for Monday, March 11th, 2019. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, and we mix it all together, kind of like um, granola. You know, it's good for you. It's good tasting. You can have it in the morning. You can have it in the afternoon. You can have it in the evening. And uh, it's just good all the time. And the goal is that we each learn at least five new things every time we get together. You don't have to stop at five. It's just at least five. And, you know, it's a goal. It's part of our system so that routinely we hit the goal, but it doesn't mean we have to all the time. It's fine. The system works. We're here. Sponsors for this episode include Captera.com slash MGG, HairClub.com slash MGG, and Jamf.com slash MGG. Easy for me to say Jamf. That's jamf com slash MGG in case I was unclear. We'll talk more about the details behind each of those URLs later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire... At least when we recorded this, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Good morning, John F. Braun. Well, it's morning for us. It's actually many days before the 11th because uh, I will be in Austin for South by Southwest uh, while this when this is released on on the 11th. We um, we've opted not to record remotely, at least not uh, not this episode. You never know if we'll get a wild hair while I'm there and. Uh, maybe we'll record something at the end of the week, but probably not. But you never know. But easier to get this one done when we're in the normal studio. Looking forward to South by Southwest, John. As uh, it had, I went last year, but had skipped a few years. And was actually pretty impressed last year with, uh, you know, the music festival. They always do a great job with and always have. The interactive festival um, was fantastic for a while. And then and then sort of uh, the, their focus changed and and didn't quite fit with with us for a few years and then, uh, last year i uh i went back and uh, i was really impressed lots of good stuff and and i'm looking forward to seeing quite a few good things this year i've already got like you know notes from people and appointments book to to check out some cool tech uh while i'm there in addition to kind of all the conferences and you know south by southwest is an interesting festival right because it's um it's as much about it. it in fact, it, I would say it's more the interactive part, especially is more about the people and the business of it. Uh, but, you know, people bring stuff there and they do have an expo floor and there are cool things on the expo floor. And, I, you know, I, I think it's I think the expo floor there is overlooked. So uh, so it's always kind of a cool place to go and, and mine for things. And so I'm looking forward to that. I get to do some of that this weekend and and then. um and then I've actually got a trip to Houston in the middle and then music festival at the end. So pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yesterday was exciting, Dave. Talk to me, John. You know what? Smart homes are great, except when they're not. <laughs> so um, Wink uh, looks like they had a they had a meltdown yesterday. It, at the um, and this is the yesterday, of course, being no one knows when yesterday is. Or maybe they can no. relate it, but yeah, Thursday, uh, the the seventh, the, Wink Wink's cloud service started having connectivity issues, right, or response issues, I should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I got a, a text around eleven o'clock, and they, you know, they have a status uh, thing you can get notifications by email or text or whatever, and I was like, oh yeah, there's there's something up, and I'm like, okay, eh, whatever. Then I wasn't really doing anything. Uh, smart home like um sure throughout the day but um when i did uh you know i walked into my entertainment center and uh i tell you know who i say i usually say uh lights on and the, the lights go on well i said it and uh -huh. after a couple of seconds you know who said um yeah i'm having trouble talking to your uh your thing uh maybe check the power or something so run upstairs and there's a pulsing blue light which means help yeah <laughs> Uh, and they, and they'd still reporting on their status page. Um, so that, uh, things are up now. The good news is that, uh, you can still manually control. So what I had to do was, you know, like turn, turn the lights off and 
back on and then the, the bulbs came on. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Of course. Right, right, right. Yeah. This and is it. Um, also oh. they have, you know, buttons to manually. Um, okay. You know, yeah. Set it. So the thing is you can, you know, like a caveman go back to manual operation. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, but if you've, I, I mean, you joke, we joke about the caveman thing and, and of course you're right. I mean, you know, re, rewind 10 years and that's exactly what we were doing and everything was fine. But if your house now sort of operates and relies on these things, that can be, it can be pretty disruptive when, when you have something that functionally relies on a, a cloud service and then suddenly does, you know, the cloud service is down. You have a problem. We've talked about this with some of our Wi-Fi mesh uh, products, right? Eero. I'm pretty sure Eero still has this problem, although they, uh, they might've fixed it last year. So I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but certainly when Eero launched and for, for many, many months and perhaps, you know, year or years after, if your internet connection went down or, as is the case that you're experiencing at the moment with Wink, if their cloud service goes down, which is the same as your internet service going down and that your Eero can't talk to the cloud, well, your Wi-Fi would shut off, like even internal to your house. So you couldn't, uh, if you were using it, you know, to like print things or stream from your local Plex server or, you know, anything like that, like, or to back up to your time capsule or whatever you use, like that's, that's it, right? There's is no Wi-Fi. Uh, and Plume did that originally too. And they had it even when their super pods originally came out, but uh, I know that Plume fixed it. And I, I have some, I know there were discussions on the Eero boards about it and I'm pretty sure it's fixed now, but, but it is an, you know, it is something to consider when you've got, functionality that relies on cloud connection uh, when you don't have cloud connection you don't have that functionality it's it's definitely something to be aware of especially you know with wi-fi i mean that presents the problems we we, we discussed but with like smart home if your schedule say for your heat going on and off uh, was tied to some cloud service well that wouldn't be happening right you know, and that's not so good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, the more we become reliant and, and mo the more these things integrate into our lives, like, the, yeah, that's yeah. Like, And this has been down for almost 24 hours now, right? Wink's thing. Yes. Whew. Yeah. Their, their page says there's still a problem though. A friend of mine, um, out in Arizona, um, I think that's where he is now said, I'm not having a problem. So they're saying, you know, scattered problems. And I don't know if they're, it's their back end or, or, or what I think they have deeper problems though, because you know, I was searching for um, an article, you know, to confirm what the, the pulsing LED meant. And so I searched online and a couple of wink articles came up in, in the Google. Yeah. And I click on them and I get a 404. So I think they have deeper problems. Oh. Oh. Huh. Yeah. yeah. That's so the not thing so is good. they're not the only one. So I did a search though. So so one thing I did is um, you know, just to check out the uh, competing product and um, Samsung has a uh, smart things hub, right? So I ordered, I ordered up one of those just to uh, check that out. I don't know if I'm going to abandon wink, but I'd like to check out the, uh, competing product. And That's it was less great. Expensive. But, but I did a search online and, and they had an event as well. Oh, like interesting. A, like a year ago where, okay. yeah, nobody, nobody could do anything. And supposedly wink says that they can do local control. Um, but I, wasn't able to get that. And that, you know, I ran the app and, you know, I touched one of the lights to try to turn it on. And it was like, Nope. Huh? Similar to the thing you said is that, you know, you would think that if it's not connected to the cloud, you could still do local stuff, but it doesn't seem to be the case for a lot of, uh, products. right. 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 Yeah. 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 Huh? So cool. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I mean, it, it, it sucks that you're going through this, but I'm actually really excited that you'll be able to do some a being. Cause I, I, I just in my personal life, I get questions from people, which hub should I get, you know, the wink mm -hmm. or the smart things. And, um, and you know, it's always like, well, it, it, I, I can only go on anecdotal stuff and, and anecdotally, it seems like people like the smart things better, but I don't know if that's just because it's more popular. So, so I'm, I'm actually excited about this. So your, uh, your pain is our gain and that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it came back like 
at 11 last night. So I'm, I'm, you know, back in business. Oh, you are. Oh, so it's not offline. Well, well, they still say that they. Oh, the I see. OK, I got it. Just scattered. So it's scattered. Got it. Got it. Got it. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, we have uh, we have all kinds of tips. We have man, we've got everything. I um, I want to take a quick minute, though, here, John, and uh, talk about our first sponsor, if that's OK by you. Absolutely. All right. We all know how much fun it is to manage our own devices, right? I mean, let's face it. We enjoy that stuff at some level, but at some level we don't. And when it stops getting fun at all, it was when we have to manage other people's devices. Well, Jamf can change that for you with Jamf Now because Jamf Now makes it easy to set up, manage, and protect not only your Apple devices, but the devices for all of the folks that work for you and that you have to support. The people that you're responsible for in your organization or maybe your clients, this is what Jamf is for. You can check your digital inventory. You can distribute Wi-Fi and email settings. You can deploy apps, enforce passcodes, protect company data. You can even lock or wipe a device as needed from anywhere with Jamf now. It helps you manage your devices so you can focus on your business instead. This is the trick, right? There's only so much time in the day and you need to be efficient about everything that you're doing when it comes to tech support and managing devices. Man, that can be a time sink. Even just syncing time with the person to do it, to get in the same place with Jamf now, you don't have to because you can remotely keep track of your own Macs, your own iPads, your own iPhones, but also all of those for the folks that you need to take care of. And what's even cooler, Mac Geekab listeners can start securing your business today by managing your first three devices for free. You can add more starting at just two bucks a month per device. Now, there's a special URL you have to go to. Go create your free account today at jamf.com slash MGG. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG and take your efficiency back into your own hands. Trust me, you will love this. And it's free to start going and, and actually free for your first three devices forever. J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG are thanks to Jamf now for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, now let's go to, uh, let's go to Steven. Actually, we've got tons of tips here. So Steven says, um, this one's so cool. He says, I know the year is still young, but here is quite possibly the most useless quick tip of the year for you. But it's so cool. In messages on the Mac. So you launch messages on the Mac with the cursor in the text entry field, like where you would type a message to send to someone. You can use option up arrow and or option down arrow to browse through your previously sent messages in that chat. So uh, very similar to what you can do in the terminal with, uh, you know, with the up arrow, you can see all your previous commands. Now in the terminal, this is like this is super helpful because if you want to repeat a command or make a, a small edit to a command that you've previously done, you just go up arrow and, and either hit return to to re, you know, to to duplicate that command or, you know, then you can just edit and, and go do it. Super, super handy. I'm not sure why this would matter at all in messages, but uh, kind of a nice little Easter egg. So thanks for sharing that, Stephen. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I, 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 I'm trying to figure out like why the engineer or engineers that that put this in there said, yeah, yeah, we, well, we at least want it for us. Like there's a lot of things like that, that happen, you know, and we find them and talk about them here. This one, I'm not sure I know the use case, but it's fun anyway. So there you go. Pretty good. Huh, John? Yeah. And, um, speaking of messages, um, I actually had, um, on, uh, on my Facebook, uh, uh, a friend asked the question. Sure. How do I archive my messages? And I'm like, hmm. Archive That's your like, iMessages? Yes. I don't know that I, my answer, I'm curious if there's actually an answer to this. My answer is you don't. So one suggestion I made, um, it doesn't quite address the issue, um, but uh, putting your messages in iCloud, speaking of clouds, right? 
would at least distribute them among all your devices. Um, but I don't think that really answers the question. Right. But then right. I saw this in, I think, my Twitter feed. Um, and I'm going to verify this. Uh, so, yeah. Um, amazing, I think, may be the answer. Oh. Oh, that's true. And then I'm looking right now. And so we can pull your messages. Right. I think you can then take that. And I believe you can then save it. Huh. And and then and then the trick would be delete it so that they are truly archived and not just I mean, I I'm amazing will back them up. So so at least there's that. Right. But um, yeah, oh, no, here we go. OK. All right. On the bottom of the screen now are uh, it says export to PDF, export the text and export to CSV. Wow. And export attachments. I like it. So, <clears throat> huh. So Smart. If for whatever reason you. um. Yeah, I guess for sentimental reasons or something like that. Sure. You want to save certain messages forever. Yeah. Good catch. I like it, man. That's good. Very cool. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Going to. Oh, man. Patrick sent something in and I'm actually really happy about it. We've been we talked on and off about uh, Finder settings and finder issues and laying out your finder windows and all that stuff. Um, Patrick has a cool stuff found for us that I think is perfect. And he, cause he wanted to uh, minimize the width of the sidebar, I think. And, uh, and he, he, you know, we were going back and forth and he finally said, aha, never mind. Uh, I decided to start using extra finder X T R a finder. And uh, he, with that, for this particular thing, he's able to tell it to maintain a minimum and maximum width that keeps uh, whatever columns it was that he wanted to mess with wide enough to read, but not too wide. And I think that's the, I think that's the answer for a lot of these, you know, finder tweak things. Um, the, the issue I'm pretty sure is that you have to turn off uh, system integrity protection, at least to install it and perhaps to run it. Um, I, you know, I'm not I, I, the system integrity protection. I have not run into a scenario personally where it has saved me from something. And of course I've run into several where it's put, put up walls. So I, on my machines, uh, like on this one here in the studio, I've turned it off because I like to use switch res 10 switch res X. And in order to get that installed and running, uh, you need to turn off SIP. So, um, I, and I have not, I have not yet regretted that. And I don't believe that I will. So, but thank you, Patrick. Very cool. You still run with SIP, John? Yes. Okay. I haven't had a need. You haven't had a need. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend turning it off just for the sake of turning it off. But as soon as you find a need, um, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, yes, um, th th we did have a question uh, from Bob about tweaking Finder window layout. And if you don't want to use extra Finder because you don't want to turn off SIP, Bob was having a problem his sidebar in the finder wasn't appearing at all. And, uh, and that was on, you know, less than desirable for him. So, you know, the finder is a weird thing and I can, all I can do is offer some general advice for trying to get the finder to retain settings. So there are a few things where you actually have control over this and preferences in the finder. You can go to view show view options um, and also in the finder menu preferences and frankly, all four tabs in finder preferences can adjust the types of things that you, um, you know, that, that like default location of a new window and layout options and things like that. Those can all be tweaked in a, in a very intentional way there. But in terms of window location and size, this is where the finder gets a little interesting it used to be, and I believe the instruction still is, but correct us if I'm wrong, feedback at Mac Geek Gab podcast. Nope. Why do I say that? It's not Mac Geek Gab podcast. I don't think we even own that domain. Maybe we should. It's feedback at MacGeekGab.com, John. Yes. And just to make sure you heard it right, feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I said it right. Okay. 
Good. Uh, but the way that I have been taught to control the placement and locate and, uh, and size of finder windows is to open a new window. Don't change where you are. Don't even click inside the window. Just move the window to where you want it. Resize it to what you want and close the window. That in theory is how the finder knows where you want new windows to open and how big you want them to be in practice. It doesn't always work. So um, if anybody has a tip on actually getting it to remember those things, I'd love to know it sometimes works. It just doesn't always work. Have you, have you uh, ever messed with that, John? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So does your, do your finder windows open where you want slash expect them to? Not always. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's okay. It's not just me. Yeah. Oh, okay. you know, I got to get a little exercise, you know, moving the trackball. Yeah. That's right. You're still a trackball guy. I, I always forget about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the, uh, for, for this machine. Yes. Um, Man, I've been using them forever. Well, one, yeah. it um, uh, it reduces the uh, the chance of uh, RSI, repetitive stress injury, that you're not moving your wrist around so much, right? Oh, interesting. I would have thought that a trackball would actually make that worse because of the uh, the angle that you're holding your you're holding your hand at a fixed angle while you're trying to move your fingers. I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I've I've never used one long term, so I. But I that would have been my assumption. But I, again, I'm well, no doctor and I have no experience. So, <laughs> but I was, um, but I, I ran into it initially, uh, one of my internships decades ago when it was the, uh, turbo mouse. Sure. I think they still call it that. Um, back then it was a cue ball with metal rollers and that was kind of annoying because it would you know, get gunk and stuff on it. Yeah, and sweat sure. And all that from your fingers. Every now and then you had to clean it out here. Now the technology is that they actually use um, optical sensors. Right. To, Just, uh, I mean, it's the same thing that we did with mice, right? We went mm -hmm. from using actual yeah. roller balls to optical sensors. And yeah, you're not collecting all that crap. So which, yeah. um, which trackball do you use nowadays? Yeah, it's the Kensington. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Expert mouse, it's called. Expert. No, I like it. It's got um, it's cool. got four buttons that are programmable. It has a uh, ring around the ball that you can use to scroll up and down and stuff. So, sure. um, yeah. And um, for gaming, I like it better than a mouse as well. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I find, you know, spinning the ball. You know, like some arcade games. For certain games, uh, I think a trackball is better than uh, yeah than using you know the mouse. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, this next one, and I'm hoping Larry uh, will post this in our forums at MacGeekab.com slash forums, because you all deserve to see the results of the work that I'm going to describe. But Larry says, uh, I know you're all about fixing and repairing problems on your Apple products, but sometimes a Mac will no longer be repairable. True. He says, my tip is how to continue to enjoy your Mac even after it dies. He says, of course, this tip, as you'll find, only applies to MacBooks that have the glowing Apple logo on the back of the lid. He says, many of these are going to be gradually phased out in the coming years. He says, my wife's 2013 Air finally gave up the ghost, so I decided to create something cool and practical from it. I removed the keyboard, the CPU, the screen, etc., and was left with a hollow aluminum shell. I purchased a MacBook skin for 20 bucks on Etsy uh, and a Koo Geek light strip for 40 bucks on Amazon, which works with HomeKit. He says, I applied the skin to the back of the lid to create a piece of artwork. Sure. He says, I inserted the curled up light strip inside the empty shell and situated it around the Apple logo. It's held in place with packing tape. Apple had placed a piece of white material directly over the plastic logo. He says, I think uh, he says, I left this as I think it helps uh, the light coming through the logo be more evenly distributed. I, I, my guess is that's why they did that, too. Yep. He says at night, the light emits from the empty ports and the Apple logo glows according to the color of my choice. He says, I hung it on the wall and now I can tell Siri to turn on the MacBook Air lamp or make the MacBook Air lamp red. 
And uh, he says, you need to buy some special screwdrivers. He says, I, I got mine from I fix it in order to get your old MacBook apart. Very, very cool stuff. So, yeah, well, I'm hoping he posts some pictures of this because he basically built a MacBook sconce is is what he did. And uh, and I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty good, huh, John? Yeah, I've seen uh, people do some uh, cool things with their old Macs. Uh, yeah. Some of the old iMacs, I've seen people make fish tanks out of them. Uh, the old... Like you, the Bondi you, Blue. Oh, the Bondi Blues. Oh, sure. Just like they did with the original, like the, the you know, the Mac the 128 and the Mac Plus and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Scott, actually, Scott's question is, or Scott's tip is one that we have been hanging on to for a little while here. It was catalyzed by a discussion in a previous show, but really the tip is is evergreen as far as I'm concerned and, and quite... Uh, quite thoughtful so we'll let scott share this one hey guys this is scott down in the dc area um i know i'm a bit behind i was listening to show 742 yeah i'm a bit behind uh listen one of the things that you one of the guys uh, uh was talking about having a, a hard drive error or a swapping error or so or something along those lines where where Things were happening and stuttering as he was doing on his computer. Another thing that can happen and you need to check is whether memory is okay. Uh, I don't know how – I've seen it once happen once before, but if a, a RAM chip goes bad, uh, it will try to work around it. If, if you have too many page hits on that particular piece of RAM, you'll see a lot of swapping on the disk. Um, memory is also a problem sometimes with this, with MacBooks. I've had this with a MacBook. I don't remember if it was with a Pro, a MacBook that, yeah, it was MacBook Pro that was given to me by a previous employer. Um, if you jostle it way too much, if you're not that careful with it, if you tend to be a little overzealous with it, you can also loosen the memory. So if you're, you're not getting the amount of memory, if in, you need to look in through system profile, if you're not getting the amount of memory that you think you're getting, then what you're probably doing at that point is thrashing, which could cause all sorts of problems. So when that should be something that you should always check especially on a laptop, if you are maybe a little rougher with it than you should be. Anyway, happy new year. Happy belated new year, Scott in D.C. Thank you, Scott. And uh, happy belated new year to you. Yeah, that's a, it. He's right. You know, that, that I mean, obviously, RAM can if RAM gets unseated or RAM goes bad, you can start getting all kinds of crazy issues and sometimes, as he pointed out, you know, if it jostles loose, you may have less RAM in your system than you thought you did. I've always wondered why, you know, in the old days uh, when I was working a lot on Windows machines, if the amount of RAM changed, it would tell you immediately when you turned it on, it would be like, hey, RAM changed. Is this OK? And you'd say yes. And it would save that in the BIOS and then everything would be fine. Uh, Macs don't do that. They've never done that. So. You may you may think you have, say, you know, eight gigs or 16 gigs of RAM. But if one chip has jostled loose, you might only have four. Or what you know. So anyway, um, that's it's a it's a good thing to check and just sanity check yourself to make sure that that you've got what you think you have. Pretty good. Right, John? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. So you may ask yourself, how can I test my RAM? In theory, when you turn your machine on, it does a very quick. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Power on self test. But um, it may miss it. Um, now, sometimes if it's like a permanent error, you're going to hear a number. Of, uh, I think that well, I don't know if they still do this, but you'll hear instead of your Mac starting up, you'll hear a uh, number of beeps. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if yep. the RAM is bad, I, I forget the code. We'll, yeah. Um, I'll yep. dig around. For, but, but I'm trying to remember what utility out there is good for testing RAM. Yeah, I I know Micromat had or has that utility called Atomic, uh, which will test RAM. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, but I I feel like there's, um, 
yeah, there's something that you're right. There you well, there used to be something that could. Oh no, do no, it. you're right. Okay. I'm sorry, I found it. Um they make a they make a utility called Mac Check. Okay. And one of the tests that, so yeah, it checks your power and self test, IO check, battery test, memory test, smart test, raid status. Oh, interesting. Volume structure, partition map. Look at that. But this doesn't check RAM. The, oh no, it does. Oh, yeah, memory, memory test. test. Oh, see, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a baby version of uh, you know, a stripped down version of uh, you know, compared to some of their other tools. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Cool. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Um let's see. So Jim noted something interesting and uh and I'm going to try and sort of encapsulate this down. Jim uses AT&T for his iPhone. He has um the hotspot functionality as part of that and uses it regularly regularly so that his MacBook can get online while he's you know out and about and not near Wi-Fi or anything like that. And he also uses a VPN with open VPN. And what he has noticed is that if he follows the wrong path, I was going to say the right path, but the wrong path, uh, he can connect his iPhone to open VPN. And with his iPhone, he can confirm, you know, by checking, you know, whatever, like what is my IP.com or, you know, you can put IP into Google and Google will uh, re return what it believes to be your IPv4 and IPv6 addresses or uh, there is a website that he likes to use, and I'm, uh, I think it's browserleaks.com, if I'm not mistaken about that. Uh, but, you know, he can confirm that he is connected to his open VPN server and everything's good. And, you know, his, his, um, his, his IP is all good. And then when he hotspots from his MacBook, the MacBook does not go through open VPN. It, appears on his AT&T, you know, LTE network or whatever that is. And so, and, and, and he's able to reproduce this and I, I, you know, like it's legit. I think what's happening here, and we're going to do some more tests, but I wanted to throw this out to the community too, is that, you know, open VPN is a third party VPN. It installs a VPN profile and obviously does what it does. But I think personal hotspot lives a level lower than this third party VPN. And that's why his personal hotspot traffic is just being routed around it. And I, I think it's a, a, a function of iOS, whether we would call it a bug or not, you know, it depends on your perspective, I suppose. And uh, I'm curious if this would also happen with a native VPN, like an L2 TP or an IKE V2 VPN, that is native to iOS and not being controlled by some third party profile. Does that also suffer this? So that's, that's the thing. I don't have personal hotspot on my devices, so I'm unable to test. So, um, yeah, so I think I yeah. can confirm this. So I did a quick test here. So okay. I'm on Verizon. I don't think it matters. So I, I run open VPN as well. Sure. Um, hosted on my Synology, but um, if I was connected to, Wi-Fi, not my Wi-Fi, and I VPN in and say, "What's my IP?" It's like, "Oh yeah, it's a, it's your, uh, you know, Optimum." And, it's uh, your home IP. IP, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. If I turned off, if I left the VPN on and I turned off Wi-Fi, and I asked, um, I asked what my IP is. It's like, "Oh yeah, you're somewhere in uh, Philadelphia." I'm like, "Huh?" Because of your LTE connection. Right. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So I think your theory about the layers is. Uh, yeah. Now I wonder if you disconnected from open VPN, turned off Wi-Fi and then reconnected, I think you would see your home IP. I think it's this, you know, disconnecting in the middle of a session thing It is probably because I've, I've tested that part and that actually works like, yeah. Oh, and, um, oh, and here's a good suggestion. I yeah. think this, uh, this sounds right here from our friend, Brian Monroe in our chat room, which is, uh, where's our chat room? MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Oh, right, right. Um, he'd have to run the VPN on his on his uh, computer. The VPN right. Software. I yeah. That would, yeah, that would solve. solve that would solve that part of it. Yes, d exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I'm and so I, I'm I, again, I'm just curious if this affects all VPNs 
uh, on iPhones and hotspots, or if it only affects like third party VPN, you know, profile based things. Uh, so let us know if, uh, if you can, that would be a good thing. All right, John, you, uh, you want to, you want to take us to Bob, my friend? Yeah, I'll take us to Bob. Cool. Um, let's see. Bob says, I know you rate the Synology 2600 as the best standalone router. Personally, I use Zero at your recommendation, which has worked out wonderfully. My daughter is buying a small house, 1,200 square feet. What is your recommendation for the best budget but relatively future-proof router for a small house? Perhaps under $140. She lives alone and has a MacBook Air, iPhone, Apple TV, and only one or two other connected devices. Well, my recommendation, Dave, um, the router that I had before the Eero was something that was recommended by our pals at Wirecutter. Okay. Um, and they have an article here uh, that they did in 2018, and they have a few recommendations here. So um, I guess their top is the Netgear R7000P Nighthawk. That's a, I, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I would, I, you know, it, it's not better than the Synology uh, <clears throat> by a long shot. But right. if you're if you're looking to save some money, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And their second choice or the runner up um, is the Synology RT2600 AC. There you go. Yeah. But um, their budget pick, which um, I think definitely has the right price point, is the TP-Link Archer A7. Oh, that's like old school, man. Huh. Well, um, I had an Archer, a different. Si the, the, this is an A series. I think the last Archer that I had was a different series. So I guess the A means it's AC. You would imagine. But um, check this article out and see what you think. But uh, I think you have an additional suggestion. Well, I do. Um, y you know, Synology uh, has. They're RT twenty six hundred AC. They have the older, and I think you can still get it. Their original, their OG router, which was the nineteen hundred AC, less radios or less, uh, yeah, less streams, less antennas. It's got three antennas instead of four, so it's a three by three, not a four by four, and uh, slower CPU, less RAM, but still a good router. However, last year they introduced their mesh products. And they did so with two things. One was a software update that applies to the RT2600 AC so that it can be the uh, foundation of a mesh. And then hardware, they released their Synology MR2200 AC, which is their mesh router. And those are built to be used as your mesh points if you have an RT2600 AC. And if you don't have an RT2600 AC and you only buy one of these MR mesh router things, the 2200, it will be your router and it will give you functionality like, um, you know, your uh, you can have cloud station on it or drive. You can uh, have a VPN. I believe it's it's got limited it's got a limited subset of the, the main features of the 2600 AC, but it's got the ones that you would want to use. And. It's 140 bucks and it's got Synology, same web interface and all of that good stuff. So uh, and and it's got three radios in it. It, it. They aren't as powerful as the two radios that are in the 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 other one, but it's got three radios in it, which is why it's built for this meshing and can, you know, use the third radio for backhaul if it needs to, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the other one I would throw out there is that. So we'll put them all in the show notes, I, I think. Uh, I think any of these would be a, a fine option uh, as a standalone router. And of course, the cool part with the um, with the Synology one is it is, you know, fully built to be a mesh router if, in fact, that's what you want. So you can, you know, jump right up to that. No problem. If uh, if you, you know, if, if, you know, if she moves or whatever, she can take that with her and then add another and boom, it'll it'll mesh right up. Um the Netgear, I believe that R7000P will also do what they call their Nighthawk mesh stuff. So you can buy one of their Nighthawk extenders and actually it'll it'll be smarter than just a normal extender, too. So all kinds of options, John. It's uh, it's it's good to be 
in the it's good to be in the router market i guess so yeah 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 cool yeah that tp link was a good router for you for a while they do i they i i've always been impressed with them it, you know they they understand what they're doing so indeed yeah man all right uh let's see let's go to let's go to jessica here and uh jessica i will find i promise i promise i'll find it john and i did oh yeah jessica says uh i had a macbook pro from 2013 but it crashed in january of this year and is now unusable should i get a refurb or brand new so um i'll answer the question and then i'll you know uh, and then and then i have other thoughts too but uh if what I want is available as a refurb from Apple at the time that I want it, I will buy refurb a hundred percent of the time. Uh, there's no reason that I can find not to buy refurb unless like happened with my MacBook airs this winter. I wanted to buy these. I wanted to get my son. I mean, he needed a new laptop as did I quite frankly, the MacBook airs came out. They seemed like the right things for us. Turns out they were the right things for us. Uh, and of course they were relatively brand new, so you couldn't get them on the refurb store yet. And I don't even know if they're there now, but they, it's probably getting close. If they're not there now, they'll probably be in the next six or eight weeks, I would assume. But um, the, that's the only scenario where I would buy new. Otherwise I would buy refurb hundred percent of the time because you get the same one year warranty. You get the same access to Apple care plus, right? You can buy Apple care plus for a refurb and it, it were, you know, it then extends it to the three years on a, on a laptop. And you also get a computer that's been through the hands of an Apple technician, whereas something coming off the assembly line actually really hasn't. So arguably you're getting something that's a little more certified than something right off the assembly line brand new. Uh, so I think you share those thoughts with me, John, but maybe yes. not. Yeah. No, I, my next one, I'm yeah. Uh, to save some coin. Uh, yeah. I go for reverb. Yeah. Now, if you want to save even more coin, Dave, I, I just did some searching here. Yes. So one, and I think you and I have both taken advantage of this. If you know someone at Apple, they can give you an additional discount. There's a friends and family program. That's right. Um, yeah. So if you know someone at Apple, they can help you save a little more money. But Apple also has, and I did this back in the day, a couple of different special stores. So one thing, um, they have an employee purchase program where if you work for a big company, and I did at one point, um, you get special pricing because you work for the company. So they work out some special deal and there's a you know set discount for that. Um, they also have an educational store. So if you're in school, um, you can probably save some money going through the education store. And there's also a government store. So if you work for the government, you can get a special discount as well so yeah yeah and i have i it's been a long time since i've uh dug in enough to know the details of the educational store but i do know it used to be that it was the honor system and you could pick a school and uh and that was how it worked so uh there were some folks out there that uh chose perhaps to be students of life and take advantage of the, uh, <laughs> the, the educational store. So there you go. I, I don't know how it is now. It, it, in all likelihood, it's been tightened up and you actually need to maybe have an email address for that school or whatever. I don't know. Honestly, now that I think about it, I probably should have looked into that for uh, the MacBook airs that, uh, that Lucas and I got because my daughter actually, and he, they both uh, are students at, at a university here and, and he's a student at a high school. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember toying around. Um, so they used to have a certain structure to the URL. And I think uh, so, like, for example, the employee purchase program. Right. It was fun who participated. So I think it was like, you know, whatever slash EPP slash and then the name of the company. Yeah. And, and you could go yeah. into the store for someone that worked for that company. But um, right. That's I right. For the most part, it's the honor system. Um, At least it used to be. Yeah. 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 So. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Jessica. That was good. I, you know, I, I anytime somebody says their computer is crashed, I, I always, uh, you know, here we take it at face value. You know, she wanted a refurb and, and it, it makes for a good discussion. But it is always worth anytime someone like personally calls me and says that my question is, let's describe what we mean by crashed, because it might be that, say, just your software is all, you know, munged up and you just need to nuke and pave and then the machine would be totally fine. Right. So it, it's always worth asking that question before we just go replace the machine. And I just kind of wanted to point that out too. Well, no reason to dissect it any more than that. But yeah, there we go. All right, man. Uh, Michael, gosh, you know, we're constantly finding things that use disk space. Just yesterday I was texting with you, John, that I, you know, right on this computer here, I noticed that I had like no free space. I'm like, I should have like, you know, 30 gigs for free space. Right now I have 40. I was down to like six or something. And so I I ran uh, Daisy Disk, which is what I run now because it's easier to do that in administrator mode. So that's what I did. And uh, and it found that in my log folder, the drive pulse logs from drive genius. So drive pulse is the thing that runs all the time. It saves. I think I had 28 gigabytes worth of logs from this thing. And the thing is, when you launch uh, drive genius, it goes and sort of parses through and cleans up those logs, whatever processing needs to happen. It does. But man, like that's like I don't run drive genius all the time. I don't need to. So, um, so I cleaned that up and then I, I turned off drive pulse, John, I'm, I'm done with it. I use Lingon. I want to have drive genius still installed because we tested here for some things, but, uh, but I used Lingon to turn off the auto launch and the, you know, launch if it quits thing. And, um, and so, yeah, that's crazy. You know, there's, there's a slightly easier way to do that, Dave. <clears throat> How? I just discovered this. So, um, if you go to drive genius. Yeah. Preferences. Yeah. There's a button on the bottom of the dialogue saying disable drive pulse. Seriously? Yeah. I've, I've looked for that before. I've never found that. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, there you go. Color me uh, someone who enjoys solving a problem the hard way, I guess. Oh, yeah. But what you did is uh, clever. It's clever. <laughs> Points for being clever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it surprises me that. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're, they're, I don't know if they take them and, you know, phone home to collect stats or, or something like that. I don't That's know, a, man. Gosh. Even still, ish. even once I ran Drive Genius and it cleaned up the logs, it went from like 28 gigs used down to four gigs used. That's still yeah. way too much, in my opinion. So um, we don't need that kind of data about my, my drive's health. Like, so, yeah, it's all done. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. But but it is it does 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 give me an opportunity to mention Lingon uh, 10, which it's Lingon X. So call it what, what you want. Uh, that is such a valuable tool to use for managing all the startup items that are in like launch items and launch demons and all that stuff, because you can really manipulate how they're interacting with the system. And, and in this case, you know, really control it. I, of course, didn't know that there was a way to just like disable this in the app. But if I just deleted its plist file from launch agents or launch demons, wherever it, it put it, the next time I ran Drive Genius, it put it back and relaunched uh, Drive Pulse. So I was able to leave that that plist file there and just modify it by turning off those checkboxes in uh in Lingon and, and then it, it stayed not running, which is, you know, what my goal. So there you go. Anyway, uh, that was a long introduction to Michael who found yet another way to, uh, another place where space was being used. Hey, uh, John and Dave, this is Michael calling from Long Beach. <clears throat> um, regarding that kind of mysterious, system storage issue that you guys were talking about in the last episode and have been talking about. And a friend of mine texted me the other day. He was having an issue that was apparently 170 gigs of system file taken up, um, which only left him um, like a couple gigs free based with everything else he had on his computer. I took him through Onyx, you know, Omni Disk Sweeper. We weren't seeing anything. We called Apple. The guy quickly said, um, go into mail. Apparently he had log connection activity selected in the mail app. 
and it was 160 plus gigabytes of stuff that was taking it up because of that. Um, and he, I guess he went in and trashed it. He didn't give me the details of it, but that might be something for people to look at if they're having this issue. Again, log connection activity was selected in the mail app, and it was keeping just this running tally of things. So hopefully that might help somebody in terms of checking out a possible reason. Don't get caught. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And don't get caught indeed. Um, yeah, so this is actually in mail it, to get to this checkbox that Michael's talking about. You'd go to the window menu in mail and go to connection doctor. And then in the lower right there, uh, you can check the box that says log connection activity. And again, you know, it, it's the same thing, right? It's it's putting this stuff as a log somewhere. Omni disk sweeper wouldn't see it because without full disk access and root access, uh, it can't look in those protected areas. And one of those protected areas is your mail database or your mail folders. So that's why it wasn't showing up there. My guess is that Daisy disk would have shown this. And, and that's why I'm, I'm as a long time Omni disk sweeper user and lover. I have, uh, I, I, uh, Daisy disk is now my, my first one. So yeah, anyway, nice catch, man. It's crazy. So there you go. Oh, and Brian Monroe is saying lower left corner. That's interesting because I tested this on my Mojave machine and it was lower right for me. I am almost certain, but you know, memory is a tricky thing. So thank you, Brian Monroe in the chat room. Good stuff. We will, uh, it, it'll be lower left or lower right. It's called log connection activity. So sweet. Oh, and Brian Monroe says, yes, it's lower right. Okay, cool. Uh, either way, you'll find it. You're all good. Uh, while we are here, John, I want actually I want to take a minute and um, and talk about our next two sponsors. If that works for you, my friend. Dandy. All right. We've all read some surprising online reviews, right? You know, whether you're trying to get a sweet deal on something you've been saving for or looking for that new NAS unit, you know, it's generally a good idea to read the reviews first. That's why we're here at Mac Keycap, so we can talk about this stuff, right? So why should finding the right software for your business be any different? Enter our sponsor for today at captera.com slash MGG, where you can read thousands of real software reviews and find the right software for your business. Again, that's captera.com slash MGG. They've got over 750,000 reviews of products from real software users allowing you to discover everything you need to make that informed decision. And that's why they're the leading free online resource to help you find the best software for your business. They've got stuff in over 700 categories. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution. And there's millions of people that are using this. Very, very cool stuff. So visit captera.com slash MGG for free today to find the right tools to make that informed software decision for your business. Again, captera.com slash MGG. That's C A P T E R R A.com slash MGG. Simplify your software selection with captera and our thanks to captera for sponsoring this episode. Look, John and I are very blessed when it comes to the thick lush hair that we have on our heads. We know we're fortunate in that regard. And we know that many of you are not. And that's why I'm happy that we were able to partner with our sponsor hair club at hairclub.com slash MGG, where you can go today to get a free hair analysis and a free take home hair care kit. Confidence is important, right? And sometimes one change like this can make all the difference. Hair club knows this. And that's why they're inviting you to become part of the hair club family to see how getting the most out of your hair can change your life. They understand the emotions that you're feeling. They know the questions that you have, and they're the leader in total hair solutions with a legacy of success for over 40 years. So whether you're looking to revitalize the growth of your own hair or to learn more about the latest proven methods for hair replacement or restoration, you know, hair clubs does all of this. And their professionally trained stylists, hair health experts, and consultants will craft a personalized solution for you so that you feel your best and get the most out of your hair. 
And you can see for yourself just how powerful great hair can be. Go to hairclub.com slash MGT today for that free hair analysis and that free take home hair care kit, all valued at over 300 bucks. That's hairclub.com slash MGG for that free hair analysis and free hair care kit. One more time with feeling hairclub.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Hair Club for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Let's go to Simon, shall we? We have a lot of tips from uh, comments based on really the last episode, maybe one that goes you know back an episode or two. So Simon will start us off here. We were talking about monitoring bandwidth use on your Mac, and uh, you know we talked about well if your router supports it, this, that, and the other thing, but we really didn't come up with a great way to monitor the bandwidth that's being used by your Mac. Until Simon and I think somebody in the chat room suggested this to be perfectly fair. It may have been Simon, but suggested an app called trip mode. We've talked about trip mode on this show before. Trip mode's great because it allows you to decide to not let certain apps access the Internet while you're on whatever kind of connection. Maybe you're on a limited data connection through your hotspot or you know, for whatever reason, maybe, you know, in a hotel and it's crappy and you don't want your backups to try and run and, and use all the, you know, all the bandwidth, the limited bandwidth that you have. So trip mode is perfect for this. But he says uh, you can also set it to monitor Internet usage on connections too. set it to monitor over a month and it will keep you up to date with usage right there in the toolbar. He says just ensure that all apps are allowed access to the Internet because trip mode otherwise will limit them doing what it's supposed to. He says, and boom, you're good to go. Thank you, Simon. That's awesome. That's a great idea. We'll put a link to trip mode in the show notes for sure. Good stuff, huh, John? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, in the forums, well, someone, actually many of you asked, uh, but there was a, a question in the forums too. So I'll point you there where Mac tech freak asked, he says, uh, I know you were talking about blocking spam calls. And he says, I, I can't remember what Dave's recommendation for stopping spam calls or robocalls was on iOS for Verizon users. He says, I have Verizon wireless and they're directing me to Nomo Robo, which is a buck 99 a month. Does anyone know if the service is legit? So here's the thing. Uh, listener Joe sent us a Facebook message about this too, and pointed that while Verizon's current solution is a for pay solution. Uh, there was an article in January on the verge that said that Verizon will offer free spam protection to all of its customers coming in March. Guess what month we're in March. So even better, uh, Mac tech freak in the forums signed up for the service was charged the two ninety nine, which is what Verizon charges for their own thing. Uh, they call it the call filter service. And then he called Verizon and said, Hey, I thought this was supposed to be free in March. And the rep said, yeah, it's not quite free yet, but here's a credit for your, your first month. So hopefully by the time the next month comes around, uh, it's free for, for him and maybe for all of you. So there you go. But like I said, in the last show, um, but using AT&T's call protect is it's stellar. I really, really like I, it. I, I, I understand why you're driven crazy by the spam calls on your phone, John. Uh, because without AT&T's call protect, I'd probably be, be, you know, driven crazy and annoyed just as frequently. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, look at this Verizon call filter. Yeah. I'm looking on my phone here and I, I see a little cloud with an arrow. So at one point I tried it, but yeah, I think I stopped because, yeah, they were they were charging for sure. it. Sure. But it sounds like they won't. Huh, I'll yeah. have to give them a buzz or actually stop by their store. I'm that they have a store. Oh yeah, there you go. In town, a couple of stores in town. I should go in there and see what the dealio is. Cool. <clears throat> cool. Fixed on 66 uh points out in the chat room that Mr. Number is uh is the uh oh I need to need to get the link right. Uh, Mr. Number is an app or service or probably a combination of both. Mr. Number call block and lookup uh, number one call blocking and spam protection app. So I will put a link to this in the show notes. Thanks for that. Uh, fist fixed on 66. Good stuff. Mr. Number. Pretty good. Huh, John. All right. 
uh, on, it was also in 751 that we were talking about two-factor authentication. And specifically, we were talking about it in the context of uh, developer ideas needing it. And listener Eric pointed us to a support article. Actually, to be fair, it wasn't just Eric. He just happened to have been the first. Many, many of you sent this in, and it's fantastic. And uh, it's interesting because in the same episode at a different time, we were talking about for folks that wanted to share contacts. One thing that you can do is put a second iCloud account on one of you know on your Mac and and sync just contacts with that. Well, the same trick will work for this. You have to create the separate user account in order to set up two factor authentication. That's just how that works. But once you've done that, you can then add that iCloud account as a secondary iCloud account, turn off all the syncing, add it to your Mac, add it to your iOS devices. And then when you go to log in, you'll get the normal Apple two factor authentication notifications. So um, that's pretty good. And, and like I said, we've got a support article here that, that, um, that uh, supports that and explains it. So we'll put that out there. So thank you, Eric. Pretty good. Yeah. I actually found that out uh, after, <clears throat> so I didn't read the instructions because of know, course it's me, but right. um, yes, yeah, so I created a separate uh, account on my machine called um, John Brown developer, um, set it up with uh, set that account up with right. my um, developer Apple ID. And then when I went back to my, regular account dave it had populated that id in my list really oh that's interesting yeah but it said inactive so so oh huh then once i activated it uh the thing is now i don't have to run this uh other user right um, yeah exactly yeah that's the point yep to to do uh we're on xcode or yeah the access the developer so um that's pretty good. Pretty good. Cool. Uh, on the subject of two-factor authentication, uh, listener Ron ran into an interesting scenario uh, where he was trying to connect his, I'm trying to think, uh, I think it was just mail or a mail client. Maybe it was, uh, for some reason, he needed to send mail through mobile me. Why do I say mobile me through iCloud? Oh, right. He wanted to get carbon copy cloner to send him emails. And to do that, you have to give carbon copy cloner the credentials for a mail server that it can use on your behalf to send mail out through carbon copy cloner doesn't have its own mail server. You just provide yours. No problem. You put in the server name, the username and the password. All good. Ron does not have did not have two factor authentication turned on. When you do have two-factor authentication turned on for iCloud, you can't just give it your normal password in a scenario like this because your normal password is only good with the two-factor authentication, and Apple doesn't really support that for third parties. What they do offer as a workaround is that you go in and you create an application-specific password that you can then plug in as a separate password for your wife or for your email, and, uh, and, and then this would work. But because he didn't have two-factor authentication on, he had no way of creating a second password and wouldn't need to, or so he thought. He tried every which way from Sunday to plug in his username and his password into Carbon Copy Cloner, and every time it would fail at authenticating. And then he thought, well, I got to move to two-factor authentication at some point anyway, so he moved to it. He created a secondary password you know, or an app specific password for this for carbon copy cloner and boom, it worked right away. So it seems as though iCloud's SMTP server doesn't accept your normal login, even if you don't have two factor authentication on, or at least it, it didn't for Ron. So if you run into this problem, know that two factor authentication is the answer. And then once you have that, then you need to go and create the app specific passwords. And we'll put a link. I, I think Apple's got a, um, uh, uh, uh an, an article about um, creating app specific passwords so we'll put that uh, put that in the show notes too pretty interesting workaround or solution right mm -hmm. yes interesting 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 uh, it seems like apple is very much um you know 
that like it's pretty clear they they are requiring this two factor authentication. I you know I don't blame them. Without it, people are more far more susceptible to being. Uh, you know, having their accounts compromised and that creates a nightmare for Apple in many, many different ways. So I get it. I get it. Any thoughts on that, John, before we, uh, before we move on to the next tip here, moving on, moving on up. All right, Jeff, take it away, man. Hey, John and Dave, this is Jeff calling from Long Island in episode 751. You had a user write in and say how his crash plan professional backup solution wasn't working because he could only restore 250 megabytes of data. That's not true. If you download the CrashPlan app, you can restore anything you want. If you use their web interface, then yes, they have limited you to about that amount in the past, and I assume, based on his situation, that continues to be so. Uh, Not that I've been a big fan of CrashPlan since they got rid of their consumer services, but I just wanted to make sure you got the right information out there. Have a coolio week. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, we will. And that that many of you, of course, sent in comments uh, correcting us on that. And some even suggested that you might be able to go into your preferences online and and change that limit as well. But certainly using the Crash Plan app, there is no such limit. So thank you, Jeff. Joe was one of the other ones, John, that wrote in about this and uh, and offered that correction and also reminded us uh, that uh, he prefers to use an online backup program called ARC Backup, A-R-Q. And I've been using A-R-Q on and off, actually, for years. We've mentioned it on this show several times, but now they have their ARC Cloud. And, uh, and so A-R-Q was originally created to connect to it, it, it was the software only, and then you would pick your cloud that you wanted to connect to, right? And it could be Amazon Web Services, uh, it could be S3, it could be Backblazes, B2, it could be Google Drive, it could be Dropbox, right? Like, you know, they, they supported a lot of different things. Well, recently, in the last year, I think, they created their own cloud to make life even easier, especially for first time users. And it's priced pretty aggressively. If you're using, uh, you know, you've got one terabyte of storage included for 60 bucks a year. That's not too shabby. And I've been using it on my iMac down in the office and it works great. So thank you for the, uh, for the note, Joe, and the reminder about arc. That's pretty good stuff. Thoughts on this, John. Nope. All right. I think I, I think that, yeah, I think I have it somewhere. I think they, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's good. It It's very simple. You know, it just does what it does. And that's, that's kind of the point. So, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Going to rich offers. Uh, we talked about an app to essentially give us stickies functionality without being stickies, maybe being something that, that is more tied to the menu bar and can hide and, and appear anywhere. Uh, and we offered some thoughts in the last show. Well, we got lots of thoughts from you folks. And I think Rich might have nailed it, but we have a few to share. So Rich says the app that I use now is called Tyke at T-Y-K-E dot app. He says, I like it because it's very simple. It gives me quick access to one block of text and I use it all the time. He says the first app that I tried, though, was called Thought Train at thoughttrain.cc, I believe. We have both links in the show notes. Uh, He says it works very well and seems like what your listener was actually looking for as it holds multiple text snippets. After trying both for my needs, he says, I preferred the simpler interface and functionality of Tyke. So thank you for that, Rich. That's uh, that's exactly what we're looking for. I love it when the geek challenge actually like results in an answer and isn't just everybody agreeing like, yeah, it would be great if this actually was something we could solve, but we can't. So, um Let's see. Uh, Elliot, along the same lines, had some app suggestions. 
He says, uh, Brian, who's the listener, didn't say how he'll use the notes when he accesses them. But if he has to insert them into documents, email messages, etc., he says he could make snippets in Text Expander or Alfred. Very good point. Uh, he says there are also extended clipboard apps. Uh, he says, I use one called Copied, but Keyboard Maestro could also be used this way. That's also true. And if you are not yet using an app that gives you clipboard history, I'm not quite sure how you're functioning on the Mac uh, at your full potential. I, my guess is that you're not like it is super helpful to have a history of everything that's been put in your clipboard. You know, if I want to copy uh, a few things from a web page and then paste them into an email, I can be in the web page, highlight, copy, highlight, copy, highlight, copy. Now I've got those three things on my clipboard. Now I go back to the email and I can paste and pick which one I want to paste in at a time. And I'm not having to go back and forth. And also it saves me if I copy something to the clipboard and then accidentally or not accidentally, but forget that I wanted to preserve the clipboard and then copy something else with the normal clipboard gone with the clipboard history app, not gone. It's awesome. So uh, there's my plug for that. Keyboard Maestro does that, but there's other apps that do it too. Uh, Brian says, or, uh, sorry, Elliot says for Brian's problem in the last show, one of the several shelf utilities that's out there, either Yoink or Gladys, uh, that can park text indefinitely might also be good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good, good stuff. I like it. Any thoughts on that, John? Did you have any further thoughts as as uh, as the week um, progressed? Um, oh, I actually found this article. From setup called how to access clipboard copy paste history on a Mac. I haven't gotten to the punchline yet, but uh, stay tuned. My guess is my guess is that it is um, a, uh, a a plug for uh, some app that's inside setup that offers clipboard history. Um, setup's awesome, by the way. Uh, while we're at it, <laughs> it's oh, what does it say? It says not many people know that Mac OS has a hidden secondary keyboard. Select any text, press control K to paste it, control Y. Speak up on this. What are you, what are you talking about? What? Maybe, maybe put a link in the show notes for it. Yeah, no, it's an article from setup says how to access clipboard, copy, paste history on a Mac. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll paste it in. Yeah. Okay, cool. You, uh, you cool. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, I will take us to, uh, so there you go. But setup in general is if you are someone who uses, you know, lots of little apps and utilities like we all do here, check out setup for I think it's still 10 bucks a month. And uh, and you just get access to this huge uh, library of applications. It's really fantastic. Um, I needed something the other day to convert flack files into mp3 or aac files somebody had sent me actually some fish shows and i wanted to i didn't need them as flack i don't like need that kind of quality it, 256k aac would be fine and so i looked in setup and there's an app called permute and i was like perfect that's it and it just converted them fine actually it had a little problem but you know we fixed it and now it's fine so very very cool stuff all right and then uh on the lastly on the tips here Listener Keith uh, has one from a few shows ago, but we were talking about he was the one who suggested, I believe, using the second or the extra iCloud account on your family plan as the place to use all your storage. And he said, just use the web interface once you've created the account and upload from there. Well, that works. But if you want to upload something like your photos library that way which if you're using iCloud photo library, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, it's not all that much fun because it's, a, you know, it's that's essentially a folder full of lots and lots of files. And that can be very tedious to try and manage with a web interface. So he recommends using an app called Better Zip, Better Zip uh, at, that will create a multi-file zip where each file is just eight gigs. And so now he's got these, you know, sort of bands that he can upload and everything's good. So cool stuff found there on better zip. Thank you for, uh, for recommending it. And also for, uh, the, you know, the use case there too. Very cool. Keith, cool stuff. All right. Uh, let's see where we are here. I, I want to take a minute and thank all of our Mac geek Gab premium supporters. Whose 
uh, contributions came in this week. And if you want to learn about premium, of course, MacGeekGab.com slash premium. But uh, we had a one-time $25 contribution from Anthony in New York. And then we had uh, $25 contributions on our biannual plan from uh, Joe B., uh, Eric from New Mexico, Drake from Hawaii, and Pierre Timo. So thanks to all of you for those contributions. And then on the monthly $10 plan, we had contributions from Paul from Indiana, Mike from New York, Mark from Connecticut, Working Smarter for Mac users, Bob down in Austin, uh, James from Texas, Ryan from Texas, Neil from Connecticut, and Scott from Portland. So thanks to all of you. Uh, very, very cool. And we, as I always say, we couldn't do this show without you. But it does remind me of Texas, where I'm going to be for South by Southwest. And also on Tuesday night, I will be speaking at the Cap Mac meeting. So uh, I will put a link in the show notes to that as well. And I'll post it. I know this is, this show's only going to come out on Monday. So I'll post something uh, this weekend on Twitter, too, and all that stuff. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I can see some of you out there. Would be Please do come out. They are a good bunch of people. And uh, yeah, you know, it's always fun getting together with uh, with Cat Mac and down there in Austin. So I'm trying to find a link for it and it wants to put me in D.C. I'm not going to D.C. I'm hopefully flying over D.C. So there we go. All right. Jim had a really good question, John. Um, Jim asked, he said. I know that. Uh, data that I have uploaded either directly or indirectly to iCloud is encrypted at rest as default um, and also in transit uh, as part of the process of being uploaded to iCloud and then also stored. And you are right about that. It is both encrypted in transit uh, using HTTPS, like a secure web browser or a secure website, and then also iCloud encrypts it at rest on their servers. He says, my question is, if I have encrypted my Mac OS hard drive via file vault, is my data stored on iCloud then in effect double encrypted? And this is a fantastic question uh, and offers an opportunity to kind of dig into how this is done. So the answer is no, it's not double encrypted, but let's look at why. So you, when you have, when you first create your data, it is, you know, unencrypted, right? You type a note. Let's just take a note for, you know, and a note that we're going to save as a file and then put in our iCloud drive. Okay. So we have the note. As soon as we save it, uh, that data is encrypted when it's saved to your disk, right? And so now it's encrypted at rest. And if someone were to get a hold of your hard drive, um, if someone were looking over your shoulder, they would see the unencrypted data because it's unencrypted when you're, when you're reading it. But then once you close the file and save it, it is encrypted at rest. So all good. That's file vault. When you go to upload this to iCloud, the first thing that happens is the document is read from the disk. And what happens when the document is read from the disk? It is decrypted. That's how file vault works. So now we have decrypted data. Now this decrypted data is sent securely over an encrypted web link to Apple. Great. When it gets there, the, the secure web link encrypts it before it sends it and decrypts it on the other end. So now it's decrypted again. And then Apple encrypts the data and stores it encrypted. So it's again stored encrypted. Uh, and then of course, when you read it from iCloud, the data is decrypted, sent across the secure web link. So it's this multiple stage process where at pretty much every stage, especially if you've got file vault turned on, your data is being encrypted or decrypted when it's being it's being encrypted when it's read or sent and decrypted when it's uh, sorry, let me say that the right way. It's encrypted when it's written or sent and decrypted when it is read or received. And that's just how that works. So nothing's ever double encrypted as part of this. You certainly could double encrypt something by, uh, you know, putting it in a secure disk image that's encrypted. But uh, in, otherwise, no, it's it's all being, you know, decrypted and then it re-encrypted. So. Thoughts on that, John? I have no doubt you have thoughts on this. Um, no, though I think it, it's safe to say that during the process, it's encrypted multiple times. And decrypted multiple times. That's right. Yeah. Right. So you have the file vault key. Um, you have a temporal 
of key for SSL, TLS. Sure. And that it's uh, randomly generated every time. Yep. And then yep. you got the key on the, on, on, on the end. Right. So, um, yeah. So it's encrypted and decrypted three times, I guess. Right. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it's not. Yeah. So I think that's the, the safest way to say it. it's not double encrypted. It's it's or triple encrypted, but it's encrypted three times. Right. Yes. It. Yeah. No, that's exactly. Yeah. That, that's a perfect way to encapsulate it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Oh, if you're on Wi-Fi, it's it's encrypted again, right? <laughs> if you're on in, uh, secure Wi-Fi, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so four, four. Yeah. Times. Actually, at that point, it would be double encrypted temporarily, right? If if you're on encrypted Wi-Fi and you are, which is Wi-Fi with a password, and you are sending to iCloud, your Wi-Fi connection is encrypted, and then the tunnel to iCloud is also encrypted via SSL beneath that. So there would in transit, it's possible that this could be double encrypted. Yes, that's right. That's right. Good so point. all right. Yeah. And Brian Monroe, actually, I like the way he's describing it in the chat room. He says uh, it's a chain of encryption and decryption. So and I, I yeah, mm-hmm. that's a, a good other way to say it. While we're talking about encryption and protection, and you mentioned Wi-Fi, it's a perfect thing. Uh, I know we're, we're going to run eh, like a wee bit long, but um, Ken writes, he says, I've used a VPN for a few years. And lately, I've noticed that in certain environments, VPNs are blocked. For example, he says Xfinity public Wi-Fi blocks all Internet traffic. And I recently found a hospital I was visiting blocked the Internet when I was using a VPN too. turn off the VPN and the Internet flows fine. He says, I checked the VPN provider and they confirmed that this was the case. So is the answer to install your own VPN? Well, the question is, which ones are they blocking? And you sort of need to figure this out because we we use VPNs here all the time. Uh, as I mentioned, we have several VPNs set up in our home that we host. And then, of course, we've got some third party ones that, that we also use and test and all of that stuff. Uh we had the the uh, sort of the biggest issue that we've had is this game of cat and mouse that I've been playing with my kids school for years. And they have routinely blocked different things. They blocked open VPNs, default ports. They blocked L2 TP VPNs, default ports. So anytime I had those kinds of things set up here, uh, you know, it would work for a little while and then it would be blocked. And so I moved to Synology's VPN, which runs uh, or I can choose to run on port 443. Now, 443, for those of you who don't know, is the port that all encrypted web traffic runs over. So there's no way I thought they're going to be blocking port 443. They can't. Otherwise, nothing would work at the school. And that worked. That was that that theory held water. Everything was great until this year. Uh, you know, in the fall, my son got to school and came home and he's like, VPN doesn't work. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, what happened? Well, we did some testing and we realized that they are, are blocking the entire range of Comcast home addresses, which describes what we have, right? So port 443 is fine. You just can't get to any port on my home IP here with Comcast. Awesome. Well, right about the same time, ExpressVPN came on board as a sponsor here for Mac Keycap. And so I said, well, let's see. We tried third other third party VPNs. They were being blocked, blocked, blocked. He tried Express VPN. No issue whatsoever. It just went right through. Everything was fine. So it depends on your VPN service. But as we found Express VPN and it, it's it's serendipitous that they uh, are a sponsor and came on board as a sponsor. I don't know that I would have thought to test them. I would have thought, man, you know, we've been through enough third party ones. Uh, here we go. So there you go. Uh, ExpressVPN worked really well. And because they're they aren't a sponsor of this episode, but because they're an active MGG sponsor, expressvpn.com slash MGG gets you a deal. So you can use that too. So but the 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 point is try yeah, you're gonna have to just look at the the specific scenarios that matter to you and then figure out what solution is is going to work for those. And it's gonna take some trial and error, is is really what it comes down to. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. For a moment, I thought that maybe they had like, you know, some packet inspector that would you know, 
try to detect VPNish traffic. But, they uh, could. I mean, that's certainly possible. You could do deep packet inspection. Yep. And say, wait I a think minute. They have boxes that'll do that, right? Oh, absolutely. I, and I'm I'm sure our schools. Uh, firewalls are capable of doing that at some level. Uh, but the question is, you know, how w- uh, will they I- institute that? Cause it requires, you know, it, everything you do at that level starts increasing your CPU requirements. So it's like, you really want to do DPI on D sorry. DPI is deep packet inspection. Do you want to do that on all of these connections that are happening all day long? Do you have enough horsepower to dedicate to that? Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, the box that does that, yeah, it's either going to take some processing or money. And it's like, is it really worth the effort to, you know? Yeah. What's the goal here? Yeah. Yeah. Control. The big, the, well, the big <laughs> problem is that like Gmail is blocked on our school network. And so, you know, my wife, too, because she subs there sometimes and she's like, oh, yeah, I have to go stand by the window and turn off Wi-Fi to get an LTE connection. <laughs> you know, it's a big brick building. So. LTE doesn't work too well in there. Right. And it's like, she just needs to check her mail and it happens to be a hosted Google business account. And it's like, well, yeah. So there you go. It's crazy, man. It's crazy, but you know, that's how it works. It's, it's a cat and mouse game. And, uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm, it was just pure serendipity that ExpressVPN came on board when they did. It was perfect. So, so there we have it. That's how it's going to work. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's weird. I, I got blocked using the local grocery store Wi-Fi. I think they installed a new network and I was trying to go to a site and it said, yeah, oddly enough. Um, th- so we got some new uh, lottery machines around here. Sure. Um, and they're networked. The old ones would just dispense scratch off. The new ones now are, are networked. I actually watched them set one up, the IP address and stuff. So it's using LTE, I guess. But Sure. Um, I tried to go to the site of the lottery and it said, uh, no, you can't. And I'm like, what? Oh, huh. I was like, we're blocking this as, as questionable content. I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. There you go. So turn on express VPN and I bet you'll get there. No problem. So, uh, yeah, no, I'll try that today. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, honestly, I think part of the reason that express VPN works is that they don't just have one path in they they try multiples you don't see this as the user they make it super easy for you but um i think i think that's why my son was able to like you know they just have they know that that it's a game of cat and mouse and obviously they've got some experience with that so they you know they probably they just offer like okay if that one doesn't work try this try this try this okay we're in good sweet so hey all all right man well I think that's going to do it for us. We've told you about the email addresses. Did I mention premium at MacGeekGab.com earlier? I think I did. That's where all of you premium folks get to email. It's a priority address for us. I'm going to be traveling this week. I will try and stay on top of things. John will also stay on top of things, and we will get there. We'll get your stuff answered and and all that good stuff. So visit us there. Visit the forums, MacGeekGab.com slash forums, of course great place to not only have john and i help you answer your questions but everybody is part of the community we all sort of pitch in and help each other which is sort of the point and really actually kind of makes us all really lucky that we're part of this so thank you folks for listening thanks to cashfly at cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the podcast from us to you Thanks to all of our sponsors. As I mentioned in the show, we have uh, hairclub.com slash MGG. We have capterra.com slash MGG. We have jamf.com slash MGG. Uh, and then in our podcast marketplace, of course, as I mentioned, we have expressvpn.com slash MGG. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you uh, we'll see you when I'm back from Austin, if, unless we get a wild hair and somehow schedule something to record while I'm there. But I, I don't think we will. But you never know. Never know. Have a good week. John, help me. Help me. Help I'm me. I'm going to help you, Dave. I'm going to give you some advice because you're, uh, you're going to have to go through security and TSA and whatnot. And, yeah. Um, I just have one, uh, although you have pre-check, 
last I checked. I do. I don't um, have clear. Still- I want clear. That's the next thing I want, but I don't oh. have it. Yeah. I'll have to find out what that is. But um, anyways, the three words of advice I have for you during your travels, Dave, is don't get caught. Made up. Back.